Hello and welcome to Chester Cathedral, a virtual Chester Cathedral. And we're welcoming today Lady Milena Grenfell Baines. Delighted to have her with us to the, for this Holocaust Memorial Day in 2021. Lady Milena was born in Czechoslovakia in 1929. Her father was recommended to leave Czechoslovakia the day before the night Nazis invaded because he was both Jewish and a supporter of an anti-Nazi author. He was able to escape, but left his wife and children behind. When she was nine years old, Lady Milena and a younger sister, Eva, were able to leave Prague on a special train arranged by Nicholas Winton, who saved 669 children in this way. Lady Milena and her sister were cared for by a local family until their mother was able to arrive one year later, having escaped via Norway. The family were thus all reunited. So welcome, Lady Milena. We're looking forward to hearing you speak to us today. Well, hello, everyone. So my first question really is, why did you have to leave home? Well, let me start with the train. The train to England, which I came on. The train to England, the chorus that you heard, a composition by the very famous uh, composer Carl Davis, which is a story about the children leaving for England. Why did I have to leave home? Well, let's go back to 1939. Uh, my father was a counselor in our small town and learned that a very famous German author called Thomas Mann had been expelled from Germany, was living in Switzerland, and as famous as he was, he had no passport, and it would have been very difficult for him to travel anywhere. And so my father uh, asked our village whether they would be agreeable to give him, a, uh, to, to make him an honorary citizen. They were, but my father had to ask the Czech president for this, and the president sent him to Switzerland and offered uh, Nicholas Winton and his family passports to, uh, to and, and with those he eventually traveled to America. So we now reach 1939. Hitler had already invaded, um, in, invaded Austria. And uh, although Chamberlain had agreed with him that as long as they occupy only the part of Czechoslovakia that was, that was inhabited by German speaking people, um, there would be no war. Um, this, of course, wasn't true because uh, on September the 2nd, war with Germany started. I came to England on a train which for 50 years was a mystery to me how I got on it, who organized it, and uh, we didn't know the family we were going to stay with. Of course, we learned, as I say, after 50 years that the man was Nicholas Winton, and uh, this was something that he felt in 1939. He knew there was going to be a war. He sensed it with a lot of other people because already in 1938, 10,000 Jewish children, refugees were brought to England for safety. And now the Czech people were beginning to worry what was going to happen. On March the 13th, 1939, my father was, uh, was um, um, visited by two men from the Czech underground who told him that as soon as the Germans reached Prague because the invasion was happening he would be arrested for what he had done for Thomas Mann and advised him to leave immediately and indeed that evening my father left for England um, go going out by Belgium flying into Belgium and then from there flying into Prague um, the, the uh, saying that you can see on your screen is something that Nicholas Winton had, had uh, said in 1939 when he was asking uh, the Foreign Office for permission to bring Czech refugees to England. And why he did that, I will tell you later on. But this was, this was his mantra, that there is a difference between passive goodness and active goodness, which is, in my opinion, the giving of one's time and energy in the alleviation of pain and suffering. It entails going out, finding and helping those in suffering and danger, and not merely leading an exemplary life in the purely passive way of doing no wrong. This proved to be very true in, in case of my father leaving, 
because he had to go into Germany first and he met someone on the train, a lady who said, you can come and stay with me until you have to leave to fly out from Belgium. And so she took him home. And there my father met a German officer and he was afraid that they were going to arrest him, that this man was secretly helping people. He and my father traveled to Brussels, to, to travel to Cologne. He put him on a plane and my father flew to Brussels. In Brussels, they refused to let him go any further because Czech money by now was not, uh, one, was not valid. The Czech country had been invaded. And a total stranger standing near my father when he heard the problem for him came and said, look, my son was born today. Here is a certain amount of Belgian money, fly to England. And very quickly, I must tell you, the first thing my father did after the war was to try and find the two total strangers who helped him to escape. He found the man in Brussels very quickly. His name was Henry Bugenhut. But for many, many years, he, he wondered who was the German officer in Germany that had helped him. Uh, my father got a message in 1959 to come to a meeting in Germany, um, a meeting of people who, who, were, who used um, um, uh, little, little area radios, uh, radio, who were radio hands. And uh, when he arrived in Germany, in, in uh, Nuremberg, uh, they said, look, uh, Rudolf, here is a man you should meet. And they found the German officer after all these years who had, who had helped him all those years ago. Um, and he had survived the war. Um, and uh, again, those are two people that helped, uh, not in a purely passive way of doing no wrong. So that was a very quick story of, of his escape. Coming from Czechoslovakia to England was also quite a mystery to a lot of people. Here, many people didn't know what Czechoslovakia was and didn't realize it only existed after the First World War. So we, we can still see here very quickly the border of the country back in 10, 10 something and then on to these, these, these borders changed because, uh, because armies fought and, uh, and different rulers came there. But here we have one with King, Went with King Wenceslas, who is the king, who was the good King Wenceslas that we all sing about. And so it went on. Then the Habsburgs uh, conquered the country. And for 300 years, Bohemia and Moravia uh, lived under, under the Habsburg rule until finally, they also conquered uh, Hungary, so that became the Austro-Hungarian Empire. And it wasn't, uh, there we are, and it wasn't until 1918, when the end of the First World War uh, happened, that Czechoslovakia and Slovakia and Carpathia became one country. The little tale at the end, which was Carpathia, eventually became the Ukraine. So we had Bohemia and Slovakia as a country. And then, there, there we are with, without the Ukraine by now. And then in um, 1993, the Slovaks said that they too would like to be, be alone. So they became a separate country. And we are the Czech Republic now, which is almost the same borderline as it was when, we, when, when you first saw the picture. But back then came 1939. Around part part of the Czech Republic was an area where, where there were a lot of German speaking people and it was known as the Sudetenland. Hitler by now had already occupied Austria and decided that he wanted the rest of the Sudetenland countries and um, threatened the Czech president that if they wouldn't give up that part, they would destroy, they would bomb the whole country. Uh, and so Eden, who was at that meeting, and the French people agreed with Hitler that yes, they could occupy that part of Sudetenland. And here we see on the map what Sudetenland looked like. The, the gray area around the Czech Republic, uh, it was known as the, for the German occupation, as the German pro pro protectorate. And that happened in, uh, in 1938. But by then, people were very worried what was going to happen because they knew that in Germany, Jews were already being arrested 
and being uh, being sent to camps, the first concentration camp, which was Dachau, and then came the night of the of the of the burning knives on in um, November, I think, uh, when uh, the Nazis rioted uh, in Austria, particularly arrested a lot of Jews, smashed up a lot of a lot of sh shops, um, and um, invasion into the Czech Republic began. And so, when I started the story on the 13th of March, my father was warned to leave, and he left for England. And this is the photograph of Thomas Mann who came to visit us in the little town to thank everyone for arranging this. And uh, then with his family, um, he left for, he left Switzerland for, for America. But what about us? My father was now in England. And my mother, who was a doctor, we were living in Prague. And there I was at nine and a half and my sister three and a half, must have received a message that to put us on a train to send them to England. Um, as I say, there's still a little bit of mystery about my story. But um, it was discovered when we found a Nicholas Winton scrapbook that my father's uh, visiting guard was there. It says Rudolf Fleischmann. And underneath, his brother, Franciszek Fleischmann, who also escaped and joined the Czech Air Force in England. So we were to go on the train. For that, we needed some permits. And there we have a particular visa with my photograph uh, and my date of birth, of course. And here is my little sister of three and a half. And uh, we were to get on a train uh, on the evening of uh, July, uh, of, of August 1939. This is another part of the permit which tells us on the back that uh, we have leave to leave granted to, at Harwich uh, this day on condition that the holder does not enter any employment paid or unpaid in the winter in the United, in the United States, uh, Kingdom. And there's the stamp, the 2nd of August, 1939, when we reached Harwich. With my mother, my grandfather came to the railway station and he gave me an autograph book in which he had written, remember to be a faithful daughter to the country you're leaving, to your parents and to your grandfather who loves you very much. And he had the foresight to ask my aunts and uncles uh, to also leave me messages because uh, amongst them were the parents of my two little cousins one who is standing standing behind me she's a, it's a little girl called Susanna the one sitting in front of me who was the same age as I was called Anita and uh, uh, I was so glad because that is the only uh, memory I have of my grandparents my cousins my aunts and uncles all of whom were arrested eventually sent to concentration camps and uh, murdered there. But we were going to England. This is a label uh, that my, my, this is my sis sister's label actually, I have one as well, which says uh, it has number 639 on it, British Committee. And as you can see, the British is not spelled correctly, uh, Child Transport, and her name was Eva Fleischmann. And we all had to have these labels. Uh, when my sister grew up and in her 60s, uh, she was living in America by now, she was she had been a headmistress of a school. Uh, she could remember nothing of what had happened all those years ago, but she still had that label that you just saw and decided to write some poems about her label. And this is one of them. 639, a label hangs around my neck. Fleischmann, the British Refugee Committee, destination Liverpool Street Station. A brown broken label with a missing piece and a misspelled word hangs on my neck. 639. This brown broken label with a missing piece and its misspelled word in its imperfect hole identifies me. It hangs around my neck and holds me in its thrall. 
such evidence of conflict and reason, such pure dichotomy, such unbelievable opposition, such diversities of meaning, so much illogical logic, pure evil, and so much good. How can also rest in one? But on my label they do. 639 is my number, my label. My brown wrinkled label with a missing piece and a misspelled word in its imperfect whole bears witness. It hangs still on my soul, but I'm here to honor and celebrate us all. And so we traveled on that train through Germany. We were all in a carriage that was locked. We could not get out at any of the stations that stopped. We had to take our food with us. And when we got out in Liverpool Street Station, there were some photographers. And that is a picture of my little sister. We didn't know where we were going, but at Liverpool Street Station, we were met by a gentleman called at that time, Mr. Ratcliffe. Um, I know my father was in England, but my, my father was ill. He couldn't look after us. And so Mr. Ratcliffe came to collect us and took us to a town called Ashton Underline, not far from Manchester. There you see his wife, who, who we eventually called Mummy Ratcliffe, daughter Mary, and the two of us standing in front of them, looking very happy because we were. But the Radcliffe's lived in a tiny semi, in a tiny, in a very small house, terrace house, which only had two bedrooms. And because they didn't want to separate us, they sent Mary to live with their grandmother. And we lived with the Radcliffe's for a year. My father uh, was uh, nearby, but he wasn't very well. We used to see him regularly. And then mir miraculously in February, 1940, our mother arrived. The Radcliffe's remained lifelong friends of ours. And here you see them again at uh, attending uh, my wedding, actually. Uh, so we saw them all, the, all their lives until they too passed away. Mary got married and she went to live somewhere in the south of England. In the autograph book, you can see the date, 8th of uh, September, 1939. Uh, my daddy Ratcliffe wrote, to give is to receive, ever and milliner, always in our memories, Roland Ratcliffe. I kept that autograph book because in it, I also have the names of a lot of the children that I went to school with. I was sent away to a boarding school, which may sound rather posh, but it wasn't. My father didn't want me to forget my own language. And the Czech government in exile opened a school uh, for some of the children. There were about a hundred of us. And uh, the years I spent, I spent three years in the school. I met friends that I stayed with right until this very day. Many of them now have passed away, but um, that was my, my Czech school. I did have two years of an English school in Ashton on the Line, um, the Mosley Road Council School, but then I was sent away to, to Wales to attend the Czechoslovak school. And that, now, there, there's the building. It looks very imposing, but in fact, it was a very ancient manor house uh, in very bad state of repair. Uh, sometimes there wasn't even hot water, uh, but we were like one big family and we were all happy at the school. Most of the children um, never saw their parents again and one or two of them I'm still in touch with. Well, when I left school, I came back home and um, we dispersed. Many of the children tried to, well, return back home, found that their parents had perished. They weren't particularly wanted by the, by the people that had taken over their, their houses and homes. And so we eventually dispersed into 11 different countries all over the world but we stayed in touch. Well, when I left school, I came back home and um, we dispersed. Many of the children tried to, well, returned back home, found that their parents had perished. They weren't particularly wanted by the, by the people that had taken over their, their houses and homes. And so we eventually dispersed into 11 different countries all over the world but we stayed in touch. And now, 70 years later, 
And now, 70 years later, I trained as a nursery nurse. Uh, I married, had two children. Um, I was the, I, I'd sort of not forgotten about my past, but it, it, didn't, uh, it didn't come up. Um, my children went to school. And one day I got a telephone call, one day in 1988. And uh, this person said, this is Esther Ranson. Now, I didn't believe that because Ensign Esther Ranson was a very famous television, uh, television star. And uh, thinking someone was playing a joke said, oh yes, I said, I'm the Queen of England. And this lady said, no, I am Esther Ranson. And we've, we've, got, um, we've got hold of a, a scrapbook, which belongs to a man called Nicholas Winton. And uh, he is the man who organized the trains that uh, put you and 669 children uh, who, um, who brought, and brought, them to, and brought them to England. But I shall tell you about him a little later on. Because 70 years later, in 2009, uh, some people in the Czech Republic decided that we would replicate our journey. And I received a message, would I like to travel on the train for the second time? So I came to Prague with, with, uh, with my son and uh, on the railway station, there was this statue of Nicholas Winton with two children in a suitcase. Um, and it, it is from that particular platform that uh, the second train with some of us departed. There's my son who came with me and my sister who'd come to Amer from America to be one of the 40 passengers who, would, who were to travel in the steam train all the way to England. It, it was quite a new story, of course. And there is the, the ambassador who'd come, our, our Czech ambassador who'd come from London uh, to see us off. And the English ambassador, the lady with her eyes closed, called Jan, uh, they all gathered there. This was now, it was 7.30 in the morning, by the way, because the train had to leave exactly on time and it was a steam train and they needed, they needed time to, uh, to see us off. So there we were waiting. Uh, and of course the press was interested uh, and it was in all the newspapers. There were some uh, uh, English reporters there who lived in Prague who came to see us off. Oh, that's, that's the gentleman in the bow tie was the foreign minister. And their lady with the blue tag around her neck was Nicky Winton's daughter, um, who also, Barbara, who also traveled with us. She came to Prague. And here was the little girl who was dressed as people thought we might have been dressed all those 70 years ago, um, who traveled with us to represent the children who came on those trains. And there you see car number two uh, with our seats, George Baines, Milena Grenfell Baines and Eva Paddock, who, and we, and this, this was in the old, uh, same, no, I wouldn't say the same steam, steam train, the original one were, were wooden seats, a long corridor. Um, this one was a very first class, very comfortable train. And here you are 70 years later, here we are, I should say, um, and of course, people came from, uh, from America, people came from Australia, people came from, from, um, from Germany and Austria. Uh, most of us didn't know each other before, but we very quickly learned our stories. And one of them was particularly very touching because one lady who had come from America was sitting there saying that she was nine years old when her mother put her on the train. And another lady came and put a small child on her knee saying, uh, would you please sing her favorite nursery rhyme to her as you travel? And the second lady sitting next to her said, I was six years old and my mother put me on the knees of a lady and asked her to sing me some nursery rhymes. And you wouldn't believe that after 70 years, and she had come from, she had come from Germany. These two women, meet after all that time. So every one of them had a story to say, and most of them were, were um, second generation because uh, nearly all of them had lost their parents. 
And so we traveled along and there's my sister. And that's the very, you call them backpacks, we call them rucksacks that she had uh, full of food because we couldn't get out of the stations to buy anything until we got to Holland. With me sat another friend that I did know and strangely enough, her name was Dasha. Sadly, sadly, she's no longer with us. But Dasha said that we actually traveled in the first journey that she was in the same compartment as I was. And I had forgotten that. But Dasha had become a school friend during the war because she was at the Czech school as well. Um, but never actually mentioned this until we found ourselves sitting on the train. She had returned back, was married, and with her traveled one of her children uh, for to co to coming back to England. My son was uh, met a young Czech reporter who won um, a prize as a trip on this because uh, there'd been a competition for reporters to write a story about refugees and the train. She had won the competition. So my son was telling her all about England because she had to do it in English. On the first train, we had packed sandwiches and you know, there are things that are typical in each country when you picnic. And in the Czech Republic, there were schnitzels, Wiener schnitzels that you packed into rye bread sandwiches. And, uh, but on this train, uh, that's all we had with us. But on this train, there was a proper uh, uh, car with a kitchen and these two of the chefs who were preparing uh, meals for us. We were very, very well looked after because the organizers thought we were all fairly fairly old and uh, needed special care. So uh, we, we really were looked after wonderfully. And on the train was also a little jazz band. Now, a very strange thing to travel, but these people were playing music that had been composed by Czech composers um, who were also imprisoned in Terezin and eventually died in Auschwitz. And so this was another reminder for us is what had happened to people who did not survive. Um, and it was a, it's, it's strange, it's, as she said in her poem, a strange dichotomy that, that they were playing cheerful songs. We were all actually having a very nice time. And yet at the back of it all, we were remembering what had actually happened in what became known as the Holocaust. Well, you don't often see steam trains these days. And of course, each time the train stopped, it had to be filled with water from the local firemen. Um, and the people who were at the station were interested to come have a look at the engine. And there you see, it's, I suppose he's oiling it. I'm not quite sure what he's doing, but they were checked out very frequently. And on the train, on the, on the door was the Winton train traveling from Pilsen uh, through Nuremberg, through, through uh, Cologne, and uh, into Holland. And then eventually, when we crossed, another train met us to go to Harwich. When we got to Nuremberg, Nuremberg, when the war was on, was the headquarters of the Nazi party. And we were met at the station by the mayor of Nuremberg, who spoke to us, apologized what had happened all those years ago, and as he said, it must never happen again. And we then were outside. There we were wearing not the original, original numbers. These were made for us by the people who were making the film, but we were singing the Czech hymn, the Czech national anthem. And so we traveled on the train. My son, who always carries a pack of Mexican cards with him, it's a family tradition. Uh, the little girl is the third generation her mum and she were traveling. She has, had lost her pair, grandparents and my son was teaching her to play lexicon. And as, the, as simple as that may sound these days, um, I had many Czech students uh, staying with me uh, when they were allowed to come to England. And this is a game I taught many of them. Uh, it was a very nice way of learning English words. And everybody wants to drive a train. And so there's me standing on the platform um, we all took turns in, in being photographed. The original train actually had traveled all the way from Hungary. And so we came to, to Harwich. Gentleman sitting there with his arms around my son and around one of the daughters was involved in organizing the trains. 
And he told us the reason why he was so keen for it to happen. His son had leukemia and had to have a blood transfusion uh, and a serious operation. And he learned that the young doctor that operated on his son was the grandson of one of the one of our trained children who was now back in Prague had married and he was doing the operation. And when he heard that uh, there was that we, they were going to try and organize a train all the way from Prague, he helped and he was really one of the people. He said he did it to thank the organizers, to thank Nicholas Winter, to thank everyone for helping the children to escape. And so we got to Harwich and the crew waved us goodbye and we crossed over to England and on a very big ship um, which we'd never seen the sea and uh, this is something that I'm telling you but other other people tell the same story that on the ship we were given a cup of tea with milk and none of us had ever had tea with milk and we didn't like it and we were also given white sandwiches and we didn't like those either because we wanted our own Czech rye bread but the fact that we didn't like it didn't mean that we didn't eat it because we would have been hungry otherwise and we've got very soon got used to tea with milk and white bread sandwiches but now we're in Harwich and there is the second part of the Winton train from Prague to London and here is a very well-known reporter who had come down from London to interview some of us and at the same time there was a crew that was talking to my sister. They were American reporters who were telling her that that very evening, her children in the States would be seeing this particular interview. A site that met us in Liverpool Street Station. Now, this is the sort of thing that I think the Queen must see every time she travels somewhere. We were completely overwhelmed by, must have been 30, 40 photographers who had come to see the train arrive. Liverpool Street Station uh, cut off this particular platform so all these people who also came down to meet us could be. And to our great pleasure and amazement, when we got there, there was amongst the crowd, Nicky, as we eventually called him, Nicky Winton. And around them, you see this little girl with the, with, the, with the beret, that's the one who was pretending to be one of the children. But around him were photographers and people who traveled from all over England. Uh, his children, who were not able to get on the Czech trip, came to meet him. And he was at that point 100 years old. And the lady in the purple outfit was one of my school friends. And the other people had all come different ways to meet Nikki, well, to, uh, Nikki. And so we were welcomed back in Prague. There's one of the, uh, what was by now a grandmother thanking, thanking Nicholas. And with her, she brought her little grandson, who, if you can see on the t-shirt, says, thank you for saving my grandpa. Barbara Winton came to, uh, came and, and thanked everybody for, for coming and to greet us back in England. Her son uh, also, young man, gave a little speech. And then finally, there's Barbara with her, with her hands on her father's shoulder. And finally, Nicky was able to greet everybody. He always had a great sense of humor because by now some of us knew him. And his opening uh, sentence was, well, I hope it won't be another 70 years before we can meet again. And here he was saying this. He was a hundred years old. There you can see the many people who came to, to meet him. And from there, we were put on a coach and we traveled to the Czech embassy in London. And there is Dasha sitting with me and Nikki and my sister. Uh, they prepared a lovely welcoming party. And uh, we were just the group traveled on, on the train that were brought to the embassy. There we are with Nikki sitting sitting in the center. Yes, it was a very happy, happy reunion. And as I said, here's his birthday cake. He was a hundred years old. He loved celebrating his birthday parties. He lived in Maidenhead. This is a this is a picture when he was 102. Once he was found, and I'll come back to that, he had so many people writing to him, uh, visiting him. Film was being made about him. 
He traveled to the Czech Republic. He was a very social person. And they had a beautiful garden. And there was his 102nd birthday. There's Nicky sitting in his chair. And finally, on the 19th of January, 2011, I got his autograph in my autograph book. I got, he signed my autograph book. So, so, so why did Sir Nicholas Winton organize the train? He was always very interested in politics. And he and some of his friends uh, didn't believe Eden, didn't believe uh, the, the prime minister that there would be no war. And in fact, of course, war began uh, in September 1939. But before that, there were already many, many families in Prague, refugees who were desperate to get the children out. And Nicky Winton was about to go on a skiing holiday in January 1939, when he got a message from Prague from a friend to say, could he come to Prague to help? Because although some of the adults were able to leave, there was no one organizing the children. There were one or two small organizations that were helping them out, but, but it was very, very chaotic. And so he went to Prague, actually on the 31st of December, 1938, and opened a little office in, in a, a hotel on Manchester Square. And when the word got round that there was someone there who is helping to get the children out, there was a queue outside of 2,000, and I'm not exaggerating, this is a fact, 2,000 people, families, begging him to please put the child's name on the list to get them to England. Well, he put down thousands of names, but he was told in England, the only way we will allow you to bring in any refugees, because we're not really going to have any more, that you must find families who will prepare to take them on, and also a promise of 50 pounds for repatriation when the war comes to the end. And that was a lot of money in those days. And the only way he could do this was by advertising. And I found uh, not long ago, an old picture post, which some of you may still remember. And this is one in July, 1939, when Nicholas begged the post, could they find a place for two children? And this is what happened. And the picture post had a section called What Our Readers Say. They printed his request about would anybody take some children in? And lo and behold, that whole page that you see are letters from families saying, yes, we will have, we will take on children. And so he managed to find families for 669 children. There's the actual date. Of, of the picture post. There's the list with different names on them, with the names of the people who would take, who would adopt them in Surrey, Birmingham, Bristol, uh, Farringdon, Maryport, uh, Ellesmere College, all these people saying, yes, we will take on children. Some of them will have guarantors um, who would help to pay for the money, uh, but all these children, there's Richmond, Surrey, um, and of course, there was Ashton underline, but I don't know that our name, well, my name is actually on that list uh, there, but we don't know why we were chosen and how Daddy Ratcliffe picked on us too, but we were very lucky, very lucky. So there was Nicholas um, working very hard to, to get the children to England. Years went by and uh, People visited him. I used to go down on the train. I used to go down and, and go to Euston Station and pick up what used to be his favorite lunch, which was cauliflower cheese and rice pudding from, from Marks and Spencer's. And uh, I would go and visit him. And um, uh, when I tell you that when he was 90, he got a speed, uh, uh, he, he was caught by the police for speeding. And I only experienced one time being driven by him. And uh, I wasn't at all surprised. Uh, he had to, he finally had to give up driving, uh, much to his regret. Uh, but we had a wonderful time with him. And to many of those children, children now grown up from America, who'd come from the States, who came, came to visit him, he was the only living link between him and their parents. So you can imagine how, how revered he was amongst many. 
and his his fame in England only came, as I say, 50 years afterwards, when that very scrapbook was discovered, when Esther Ramson managed to get it, arranged for him to come to the television studios to be surprised by us um, in, one, in one of her programs of That's Life. And once that happened, and Vera, who was sitting right next to him, Vera Gissing, and I was sitting on the other side of him, discovered that all these years she'd only been living 15 minutes away from him in the next little village. And, and uh, she had been desperately searching herself. She was an author. Who and how did they get to England? For her, that mystery was solved. And so, um, he, as I say, he became like a sort of a grandfather, uncle uh, to many of these children. What he lived, to be 106, but uh, at the age of 104, one of us living in Israel came to visit him and they were chatting and Hugo, uh, who was also at school with me, said, you know, Nikki, everyone knows us, everyone knows about you, but the real, the real heroes of our story were our parents. Our parents who, who had the courage to send us away to safety. And we think we must make, have a memorial to our parents. And of course, his answer was, was yes, and not before time. So Hugo went back to Israel and uh, wrote to me in England. And uh, I wrote to a friend in Prague, how do you start a memorial? First of all, we needed a design. We, had, we formed a little committee in Prague with, with some people who thought that might help us. And uh, we've, we had a competition in the School of Art and Design, uh, but none of the, none of the results, we, we didn't like them. They were to be, it was to be a memory of the parents saying goodbye to the children. And uh, Susanna and I were having a meeting one day and she said, you know, I remember my parents on the platform uh, reaching up to the door to say goodbye and we reaching down to the parents and I just said well yes that's the memorial that's it and we found uh, an artist who first of all did a drawing of this and then we had to find who could actually make it and who could pay for it and so we started writing uh, uh, to everyone we could factories, uh, people who we knew that were Jewish, that, that uh, prominent Jewish people, uh, to the families of the children, and slowly the money came trickling in. But then we had to find someone who would make the memorial. And luckily, uh, the Slovak ambassador in London said to me that he knew a Slovak uh, engineer who specialized in copying anything that has to do with railways. And we then found also a man who was a, a specialist in glass engraving. Uh, so on this picture, the man in the blue shirt is the man who made the glass window. And the man standing between us is the man who actually copied, this is a genuine copy of a railway carriage door. And so the, the memorial was made. Sadly, Nikki never lived to see it. Um, but the opening, again, was a wonderful affair, and we actually got it onto the railway station. But the, prior to that, on the platform, there already was a statue there of Nicky holding a child, with a child standing next to him. And kneeling there is actually my little great-granddaughter, whose hands are the ones that are, uh, that are on the window. But how did we manage to get it onto the station was, is another little story. When the idea came up that we took it to the station, we were told by, oh, people in Prague, oh, they'll never allow that, um, not possible. It'll, it's, it's a crazy idea. I'm sure we could put it somewhere else. However, um, Nikki had a, a saying, uh, nothing is impossible if it's possible to happen. And so I wrote to the general manager of the railway station and uh, ended up with this, with this saying. And I got a letter back from him saying, 
we'll do everything we possibly can to help you to put that memorial onto our railway station. Now, the station is actually a listed building. It's a very beautiful railway station. Uh, it's, 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 um, uh, um, it was built in 18, in 18 something and with were wonderful reception rooms. And so we were given permission to have the memorial there. Now there you see the lady in the white dress with the black, uh, black bits on it. And that was at the British ambassador in Prague uh, called Jan. And next to her is a man who is now the prime minister. At that time, he was the uh, finance minister without whom we couldn't have built that memorial because he sent us a tremendous amount of money uh, by himself, not, not by the government. And he came anonymously. He didn't want this to be known, but he's holding a bunch of flowers and he took part of the, of the opening. And there you see, here we are, the actual group of, uh, of what we were known as survivors standing there, sadly. Some of those are not with us anymore. And that's taken on the main concourse of Prague Railway Station. They actually closed that concourse for three hours. Uh, this is a concourse which takes you to all the platforms because there are, other, there are two other ones, side ones, but they closed the main one so that we could have the celebration there and of course, put the memorial on it. And these are people who came as part of the opening. The, uh, the press was there. Uh, they gave them a wonderful buffet. And you, above, you can see the sort of uh, the, the design on the upstairs concourse. Um, it, was an art, it was an art deco. The whole, the whole idea, the whole of that railway station built was built in an art deco style. This is a, a little bit where Susanna and I are standing there. The memorial uh, was, had been covered by cloth and we were telling the story uh, about how we got it and how we thanked everyone who contributed, who contributed to, to the possibility of it being made. And there is the memorial. As I said, the little hands were copied by the glass engraver who came to England who took a cast of my great granddaughter's hands and then uh, my, Susanna and my hands uh, representing the parents. And here is, the here is his saying again, the difference one can make. There is a difference between passive goodness and active goodness, which is in my opinion, the giving of one's time and energy and alleviation of pain and suffering. It entails going out finding and helping those in suffering and danger, and not merely leading an exemplary life in the pure, passive way of no doing.